Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to this session about shape collections. Uh, it's the last paper session. My name is Roy Boan, and I'll be sharing this session. So we have a collection of four papers. After each talk, we will have a short Q&A with the speaker. So please ask your questions either here in the, in the YouTube chat or in Discord. You can do it during the talk. You don't have to wait until the end. Uh, and I will do my best to read them and forward them to the speakers. So we go directly to the first paper titled CME's PointNet, a CME's Point Network Architecture for Learning 3D Shape Descriptors. Um, and the speaker is Juju uh, and is play the video. Hello, everyone. This is Juju. I'm very pleasant to present our work on CMS PointNet for learning 3D shape descriptor. And this is a joint work with the lab of Professor Mingyun Gong at Guelph University and my advisor, Professor Liu Xiuping at Dalian University of Technology. The computation of geometric descriptors of 3D shape always plays an important role in many 3D computer vision applications. The vast majority of algorithms are proposed to extract the local descriptors. Such descriptors characterize the local geometric properties around the interesting points in a way that the geometric similarity between two points can be estimated in a compact descriptor space. The extracted feature can be used in the problem of shape the dense correspondence, where the extracted descriptor way can build the correspondence between one shape to some other similar shapes as shown in finger. In addition, the learned descriptors also can be used to retrieval key points or achieve key points correspondence between models. Recently, with the development of digital driven technology, some learning-based methods are proposed for better extracting point descriptors. The key idea is to learn the effective feature representation network to extract a compact descriptor from a local neighbor. Send image first uh, 3D image first uh, presents a data driver model to learn the local volumetric patch descriptor to establish 3D data correspondence. This method uses vox data as input for learning local descriptors. For the point-based method, the PPF NICE uh, learns the point descriptors by introducing a max Boolean layer to aggregate uh, all the local features into a global one, summarizing the distinctly local information to the global context. Multi-view rendered image is also another popular 3D representation for 3D shape. When produced a single compact uh, representation of a 3D shape by aggregating information across multi-views, this method always use the same as network to learn local features. However, the input of this method always need a local patch and do not consider the context information of the compilation shape distribution. So we can achieve, how can we achieve effective point-wise descriptors learning directly using the compilated 3D shape and how to extract the hierarchical descriptors of 3D shape for the problem of shape correspondence. The main consideration of our work is that man-made models have a consistent semantic structure, though have different appearance as shown in finger. This model have different number of wheels, but they have similar structure, including the wheels, handlebars, and so on. How to extract a consistent feature is a problem. Only using local geometric information is difficult. difficult difficult to calculate consistent feature extraction, so it is necessary to consider the context distribution of the model. We now describe our semis net point network architecture for learning point-wise descriptors on the 3D shape for shape corresponding. This, uh, this is our architecture. This architecture is mainly composed of three parts, namely the part of input per 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 precising the semis network and then until and uh, the NTube loss. For operati operating our network, the training and the test shape must be normalized in similar ways. So the first stage, we use synthetic shape with approximately the same verti uh, vertical axis and keep a fixed orientation around the vertical axis. Here we select one out of 50 different orientations, which leads to the smallest travel distance between shapes. 
then given a chair a pair of 3D meshes, we first unif unif uniformly, uh, uniformly sampled uh, 2048 points on each mesh and calculate the PF, uh, 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 FPFH feature for each point as a local feature of the same data. So given the 3D points with uh, 33 uh, dimensional features as input. Our target is to learn point-wise descriptors with more semantic information for learning feature on the complete sheet pair. We, uh, then we designed the SEMIS network to learn point descriptors for learning correspondence. During training, our objective is optimize the local descriptors generated by the SEMIS point network such that they are similar for the correspondence points on 3D shape and this, uh, this similar hour wise. We train our network with two streams in a semis fashion where each stream independently computes a descriptor for each point using local and global information around this point about the convolutional operation operators. Our, um, our semis point network follows the policy and architecture with two changes. We add a global feature constraint model and a feature transformation model to improve the consistent describe feature learning precise. We first introduce a global feature constraint model of our semis network. We think that benefiting from the additional shape contrastive uh, construct, uh, constructive constraint and uh, hierarchical local operator, the learned describer is highly aware of both global context and the local context. The global uh, feature constraint model is used between sub networks. Firstly, we use the travel distance as a distance between two ships, and this value can be used to evaluate the similarity between two ships. We need to distinguish the feature of 3D shape in the same category, category and distinguish the feature can make sure that we obtain the semantic point-wise feature and the more robustness feature extract network can be obtained. Then, more similar to shape are the smaller distance of the correspondence global feature is based on the travel distance. A shape constructive loss function is built here to learn global feature, shape feature. Here we give the formula of travel distance and shape contrastive loss here. Then we will introduce our sub-network of our SMS architecture as shown in the region of right dot. Uh, the feature learning network is designed as shown in finger. Uh, the sub-network is composed of two, na uh, two parts, namely point-wide feature uh, extract network and the point-wide feature transformation uh, network. Our point, network. our point network inspired by point CN gave us 3D uh, point cloud as input, a high resolution point what did character achieved for point correspondence. So operation use X transformation to well realize the points weighting and the per, uh, permutation uh, inquiries, which is a smaller to uh, 2D image convolutional convolution operation as shown in finger. Uh, give a key neighbor as uh, so of uh, convolutional operation, the neighbors are translated into a local co uh, coordinates region, denote ISP. Uh, then, uh, MLPs are applied on the local points, P to obtain points feature FP, and the new features are concocted with previous features as new local feature written as F concave. At the same time, we use M MLPs to learn the X transformation matrix. Uh, this matrix is a key times key matrix. With the previous layers associated with feature F previous, the X convolutional operate, uh, convolution operation ga uh, uh, gives the output feature for enforcing the canonicalization. In pra practice, it turns out that the network finds their ways to leverage the uh, machinism for learning better. Finally, we opt to uh, we apply it on the fit of of on, uh, on the on the input feature, uh, in which we are uh, on, on the on the feature in which we are stand standard convolutional prob uh, operation is used. Uh, uh, then the operate uh, the point convolution operation is operation is indirectly used in our network to extract hierarchical feature of the point clouds. 
The second part is a feature transformation precise. A feature transformation matrix on the point-wise character is learned to map the geometrically and the symmetrically similar points across different 3D shapes close to each other. In the same descriptor space, the global shape feature are used as input of MLPs to learn. A transformation matrix as a result of feature are consistent for different uh, uh, for different geometric shapes, our network can predict a feature transformation matrix to map the learned feature from different input point clouds to consist the described space. Finally, a tube loss uh, is used to train our network. Just like already introduced, uh, uh, the input of our network is a pair of clouds. Uh, a share net, then a share network, a share network applying to learn pointwise feature of the input ship. Each training sample can uh, cons um, each training sample considering the size of point cloud too large. We contain, uh, for we may contain four thousand and nineteen six points or more, which lead to need to build a uh, which which will need uh, build a uh, excessively uh, excessively large distance matrix. Here, first of all. To obtain consistent features and point clouds, random sampling is consistent. Uh, that ensures that uh, it ensures that the correspond uh, bounding points of the two models are sampled consistently, thereby obtaining uh, twenty uh, two hundred and uh, uh, fifty six points. Ensure that each training only calculate a distance matrix of size or uh, a um, uh, distance matrix of size. 256. Uh, then we, uh, we can obtain a feature distribution matrix which is used to calculate our contrastive loss. Genera uh, generalizing, uh, genera uh, generalizing this loss to n points of the two shape, we employ n tube loss, n to n contrastive loss. Firstly, we compute a feature space distance matrix F. Then the correspondence matrix I, uh, correspondence mask matrix I is given. Uh, the training data have the ground truth correspondence, so the mask I sample all points on the query shape is identity matrix. Then non correspondence ma uh, mask matrix M is also ga also given. Where uh, are given uh, the uh, uh, we we uh, we use a indicator function with gamma equal to uh, zero to zero point eight. Mm, the uh, the D is used to measure the distance between query points P and Q on the same shape. Finally, we define operation to sum up all the elements in a matrix, and the tube loss can be written as LC. Next, we will explain the effectiveness of the feature extraction algorithm through the results of dense and key points corresponding. Uh, first, we will show the effect. Uh, effectiveness of global feature and uh, rationality of network structure in this work. Here, um, the first column uh, given the input shape and the shape global feature are extracted by our network. The second to six columns show the top five retrieval uh, shapes from BHCP uh, data set of airplane. We find that the global descriptors can well distinguish the shape geometric structure, such as the first row of the travel retrieval results, which show all the ships have two fan on aircraft wings. This means that our global feature really gave a strong constraint, constraint uh, to our network. We also compare the learned descriptor string with the extra ship contrastive uh, constraint loss. Uh, and without the loss using the CMC and the the uh, con uh, correspondence accuracy a curve. It is interesting to see that architecture without shape loss already achieve a reasonable result. Uh, while using the extra loss and the feature transfer matrix gave a well performance boost. We observe that our extra local geometry descriptor outperformed other learning method uh, on the CMC curve. And also shows the AC curve, the color is denoted denoted the same with CMC curve. Uh, based on this curve, we believe that our method can well learn semantic geometry described based on local property and the point-wise global distribution of the um, global shape and successfully embind the semantic similar feature points into the character space closed than other method. 
In addition, we also report the evaluation measure、uh, measures measures the、uh, uh, numerically for this method. We also show that our method can obtain accurate key points can response e uh key point can respond even though the input model have high resolution with um four thousand and ninety six points uh giving a query point uh, uh with red、right、point on one ship we only show the top three closed feature points on the other ship with the right uh with the green points. Then we also show the visualization results of dense correspondence on data set. Each ship has four thousand and nineteen six sample points on PHCP data set. For each category, we first、uh, the first three D ship descriptors are projected from the learned space into RGB color space, and the corresponding points on the other ships have the same RGB color for the model of airplane and motor back. We also show the result on. Of helicopter and the chairs on the PHCP data、uh, say BHCP data site. For the problem of dense correspondence, we also show some example of dense match between some partial noise scan ships and the complete ships with different geometry structure. Benefit from benefiting from our ship contrastive loss and the feature transformation op、uh, transformation operator in our network. We do not need to fine tune our net when extracting descriptors from scan ships, and the learned descriptor can have a, a accurate、uh, correspondence to the completed ship picked from BHCP dataset as shown in the figure.、Uh, where corresponding points are visual、uh, visualization with same color, it's obvious that our method can still produce robust descriptor to dense match.、Uh, Uh, match them with complete shape, even though the scan shapes have large difference between geometry details. Here, the scan shapes are obtained from Kinetic site.、Uh, in addition, we also test our uh, uh, architecture on Model Night uh, forty uh, forty data site.、Uh, finally. We distribute a Gaussian noise over the position of point clouds, and we use our point night point network to extract point wise descriptors from noise version of airplane model. Here, each ship has a、uh, four thousand and the next uh, six uh, nineteen six points. The feature are used to obtain the dense correspondence between different ships, and the correspondence results are showing from a show from top to bottom. We give the input ship with zero uh, uh zero point.、Uh, Uh, one zero point one two and zero point fifteen, uh, percentage Gaussian noise, respectively. In uh in this uh in the first column of descriptors of the shape, we project from the learned space into RGB color space, and the other column show the results with correspondence color map. We also show some results, which are the comparisons between our descriptor and uh, uh, the 3D shape position. The dense correspondence results are given here. The two, the top row shows the plausible dense correspondence results using our descriptor due to that our descriptor consider both local and global context of the shape. In addition, the key point matching results are shown here. We show the top twenty. Retrieval points and the three top retrieval points in part A and B, respectively. The first row of、uh, of two parts give our results. So these results also illustrate illustrate、uh, that our point wise descriptor have more local properties and can better understand the semantic meaning relative to the globe shapes. In summary, first we employ a novel semi-semis network architecture to extract robust point-wise descriptor, which can be used to 3D shape correspondence and key point matching task. We use a many-to-many、uh, -many, uh, lost function in training stage for learning the point-wise descriptor on complete 3D shape. That is, our network is always aware of shape points distribution when establishing. Uh, correspondence between a pair of three D shapes. In addition, a、uh, strategy for randomly selecting query points is used to increase the randomness of the correspondence point pair.
for training in the uh, test phase, uh, first, uh, in the in the test time uh, stage, the number of query points can be used uh, can be uh, 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 arbitrarily uh, increased. Uh, increased. Uh, we can calculate all any dense correspondence pair of the three D shapes. We employ a two loss strategy to train our Siemens network. Not only a tube loss is used in the end of our net, but also a constraint loss is used in the middle of our network. By introducing the constraint loss, our convolutional to deconvolutional network architecture can preserve the important global information. In addition, a feature transformation matrix calculated based on the shape features are uh, used for better obtain point-wise descriptor continue, uh, which contain more shape semantic information and experimental experimental sh uh, results show that our approach outperforms state of the arts. That's all I talk. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's the first talk. Um, the speaker is not yet here. Uh, so let's first of all thank him with our hearts. Um, maybe he'll join uh, later. Um, so I can't really ask him questions right now. Okay, I will introduce the next uh, paper and see if he will join. Um, so the next paper is titled uh, Effective Annotations Over 3D Models. The authors are Federico Ponchio, Marco Calieri, Matteo Delle Piane, and Roberto Scopinio. Um, I guess we'll move on to the next talk. Uh, so the speaker will be Federico Ponchio. Um, and please show the video. Hi everybody, I'm Federico Ponchio from East CNR in Pisa. The subject of this talk is 3D annotations, a survey of the existing solutions and our volume dipping approach. An annotation over a 3D model identifies a location in 3D and attaches some kind of information to it. We are concerned with the first part, how we define where the location is. In particular, we will focus on annotations created by user-driven interfaces, and we will not take into consideration related topics such as semantic segmentation, structural or functional subdivisions of a shape, or scalar and vector fields defined over a surface or a volume. Point, lines, areas and volumes are used to identify a location. However, the main difference in annotation approach is in which space these primitives are defined. An annotation can be defined in surface space, for example, a subset of the triangles in a mesh. If the mesh is provided with a parametrization and a texture, it's possible to draw the annotation directly on the texture instead. We could define a volume, for example a box, to select a region of space and highlight everything contained in it. Hybrid approaches are also possible, where the annotation is defined at the same time in more than one space. Before having a look at the state of the art following this classification, there are a few common issues that motivate the choice of a technique over another. For example, creating an annotation over high-resolution images and later mapping them onto the 3D model would be great. We could use existing interfaces and tools for image annotations, and working in test to space would make this much easier. Painting a 3D object with a virtual brush or drawing a polyline one point at a time are two ways to create a mask. Painting can be easily implemented in a discrete domain using pixels or triangles, and the consequence is that the precision of the annotation depends on the sampling density of the model. 3D annotation transfer is the problem of moving an annotation from a 3D model to another 3D model. The models might be just different resolutions of the same model, or a 3D scan performed at a different time before and after a restoration, for example. The complexity of this task 
depend on the representation of the annotation, and usually it requires a sort of mapping between the two surfaces. Level of detail and multi-resolution are techniques that make possible the visualization of large models on the web. If we have a solution of the annotation transfer problem, we can show the annotation while the resolution of the model on the screen is changing to adapt to the user needs. A simple way to identify a region in a mesh is to define an location as a subset of the triangle of the mesh, or points in case we are working with point clouds. Working in surface space means that we can apply any geometry transformation to the mesh and the annotation will be preserved. This is the case with subsets. The main problem with this approach is that the precision of the annotation is limited by the sampling of the model. If you want some precision in annotation, we need to work with dense, uniformly sampled models. In other words, models that are heavy for storage, transmission and rendering. 3D meshes, in particular textured models, are often optimized or simplified to limit the number of triangles. The previous segmentation approach, just using subsets of the triangles, cannot follow the details of the texture, as you can see in the picture. A workaround is to trim the mesh, cutting or subdividing the triangles. Defining a parametrization over a model allows us to create and store annotation as simple images. For a certain class of models, it is possible to work directly into dimension, if a good parametrization is available. The parametrizations should not be too much fragmented or distorted, and it should be easy for the user to mentally map the image to the 3D model. Unfortunately, this is true for a very limited class of models. When the parametrization is fragmented or too complex, the annotation can be painted over the model using a 3D interface. The position of the cursors need just to be mapped back to the texture image. The mapping part is a bit tricky and the rendering involves layering textures. On the other hand, the annotation are just images. The annotation transfer problem is just as complicated as in the segmentation case and of course a parametrization is needed. If we have a 3D point cloud and a set of oriented pictures, each picture and its projection over the 3D model define a parametrization. It's not a parametrization used for rendering, but it's not a bad one for local annotation, and a whole collection of pictures form an atlas. An interesting approach is to define an annotation both in surface space and in texture space at the same time. The fact that we can annotate directly over high resolution photos allows us to work easily even when the 3D model quality is not very good. A good user case for this application could be the traditional pipeline in restoration projects, where the state of the object is mapped over a set of photos. The possibility to automatically transfer annotation between images seems quite useful. A forward and inverse projection is well defined if we have a dense, regularly sampled 3D model and the pictures are precisely aligned. Moreover, the precision of the annotation is limited by the resolution of the model, not the resolution of the pictures. In volume space, the region of interest is defined as the intersection of the model with the volume. Transferring a volume annotation from a 3D model to another 3D model requires only to align the two models in the same space. For the same reason, level of detail or multi-resolution can be very easily supported. Simple primitives such as a sphere, a cylinder or box are easy to implement and are currently in use, but these simple primitives are not very practical for defining a complex region. The volume surrounding the surface can be split into small cubes or voxels, and this is basically a 3D texture. Here an annotation is simply a subset of the voxels. The software that developed this approach, Agatha, is a versatile system that allows raster spatial computations similar to what can be done using digital elevation models in a GIS. Agatha supports also vector annotations, projecting them into the voxel space. And finally, the rendering can make use of a multi-resolution technique. On the other hand, Agatha is a complex implementation and requires large data structures. It doesn't seem easy at all to implement Agatha in a web interface.
Within the restoration project of the Fountain of Neptune in Bologna, our group was asked to develop a fully 3D documentation and mapping system. The fountain is a large monument. The Neptune stat alone is 3 meters tall and has 37 bronze elements and a lot of stone. The documentation created during a restoration project involved the creation of a large number of thematic maps, documenting the state of the materials, deterioration and planning operations. Traditionally, this work is done over a set of photos, but the three-dimensional nature of this monument, so many statues, require a large number of photos to cover all the possible view angles. The mapping work is partly performed at the location and partly working from home or office. The system was supposed to run on a diverse collection of devices, tablets, notebooks, Macs, and moreover the network support was a shared Wi-Fi with limited bandwidth. The whole monument was laser scanned and a large collection of 3D models generated. The final dataset is about 600 million triangles. Even with a large number of individual components, some of the models can be pretty large. Visualization alone was a challenge. A web solution was the only way to support all the kind of devices. We customized 3 d Op, a 3D WebGL engine that provides compression, streaming and multi-resolution. Existing solutions for 3D annotations are not really suitable for this environment, either because of the complexity of implementing them on the web or the lack of multi-resolution capability. We chose to work in volume space using watertight meshes as volumes. Volume annotations naturally support multi-resolution and the volume meshes does not require a large number of faces to accurately follow the contour of the annotation. We developed a user interface to create the contour of the annotation, a service to create the volume mesh from the contour, and a visualization algorithm that could highlight the selected region. The user can draw the polylines as a sequence of points on the model. However, the whole polyline must be visible from a single viewpoint. In this very simple example, the user draw a square on a curved surface. The user can draw the polylines as a sequence of points on the model. However, the whole polyline must be visible from a single viewpoint. In practice, the user can zoom, pan and rotate the interface to inspect the mesh while creating the polyline. But when finished, a viewpoint must be selected. The volume mesh is created on the server mainly because it requires the highest resolution of the model and the client may not have the final resolution. Moreover, on very large annotation, the process may require a few seconds and low-end devices might just be too slow. The polyline is triangulated using the projection from the selected viewpoint. The triangulated polyline becomes the base for a prism, extruded in both directions. This simple step works when the surface is mostly flat. However, in the case shown in this picture, no depth of the prism can, at the same time, include all of the selected area and exclude the other side of the shell. The volume needs to follow the surface, as a flat prism might not include a curved part of the surface. To do so, the model is rendered from the selected viewpoint to a depth buffer and the collisions between the surface and the prism can be detected. If the other side of the surface is too close, for example in the case of thin walls, the volume might include unwanted parts of the surface. Therefore, we also rasterize the back portion of the surface in a second depth buffer to also check collisions. The vertices of the prism are adjusted vertically to follow the surface. And finally, each face is tested and in case of collision, the worst offending edges are flipped or split until the volume behaves. The stencil buffer is used to detect how many times the ray from the viewpoint to a pixel on, this, on the surface crosses the volume. A not number of crossings means the pixel is inside. This algorithm is very fast there is no shading involved and the number of triangles per annotation is generally low.
so even thousands of annotations can be rendered in real time. The annotations can also be rendered directly as simple transparent meshes in any graphing engines, even if some precision is lost when looking the annotation at an angle. This depends on the prefined offset in the volume mesh building method. The single viewpoint limitation when processing the polyline forces the user to trace the annotation in parts. The parts, however, can be easily joined in the single volume, and we use the Cork Boolean library for this task. The most important feature of volume clipping for our Netuno restoration application is the fact that multi-resolution of the web is supported without effort. The annotations are also very lightweight in terms of bandwidth, RAM and rendering time. This combination was crucial for the success of the Netuno project. Finally, there are no requirements on the model in terms of sampling, parametrization, even point clouds would work, as long as it can be rendered over a depth buffer. The volume creation algorithm is quite complex and some pathological cases, such as extremely thin features or broken surfaces, can result in wrong volumes. Definitely some work needs to be done in terms of robustness. In this demo, you can see how the whole monument can be explored in high resolution on the web. Each element of the fountain can be selected and loaded in full resolution. A large number of thematic maps can be easily rendered and selected individually. This paper is dedicated to the memory of Matteo Delle Piane, our colleague and friend. Thanks also to Marion Lamé for kind support in writing the paper and the presentation. Okay, uh, thank you for the talk, Federico. Let's see if uh, there are any questions. Um, right, so there's one question um, from uh, Usin Arsan for the annotation transfer over same or different 3D. Wait, is that from the previous one? <laughs> ah, sorry, so this is from the previous. Uh, the, the annotation problem uh, for uh, for the volumetric annot annotation is uh, basically for free because the annotation is recording the volume. Yeah, wow. okay, sorry. Um, oh yeah, okay. So sorry, I'll, I'll read the question again. So for the annotation transfer over the same or different 3D model, is there any particular technique algorithm used? And if yes, what is that? For the annotation in um, surface space, a subset of the, of the triangles, there is a paper that explains how it can be done on, on this kind of uh, annotations. For the textures, you don't really uh, have, you have a similar problem, but I haven't, haven't seen an algorithm on that uh, approach. The volumetric annotations get this problem for free because the, it's in the volume and code in the annotation, so you don't have to do anything. Okay. Uh, let's see if there's another question. Uh, maybe I will ask one question. Um, so you mentioned that the polyline must be visible from a single viewpoint um, when you yes. create it. Um, is that the limitation of the method? Is that because the shader works this way? Uh, no, it's a limitation of the volume creation algorithm. No, not uh, not of uh, the rendering algorithm. Just require a type a type of. Uh,
a closed mesh. So it has no limitation in that part. But the algorithm to create the volume is complicated because you have to take into account the shape of the object. And if you make a curve going around an arm, it's very complicated to define which part of the surface is inside, which part is outside, if the model is not perfect. Usually model can have uh, holes, cracks, and any kind of problems which are very difficult to detect. So we made this limitation to make the reconstruction, the volume construction algorithm more robust. Okay, but you, you could overcome this, right? Uh... Yes, because you can just draw a part of, of the annotation, then another part and join them. It's, yes. Okay. Or subtract them also. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so there are no more other questions. Uh, yes, so we there move is on. a question from Marcus. Okay, you, you fall it better than me. Uh, he's asking uh, uh, if, okay. the annot if, the, if he can recover the annotation or originally made in the photographs. Uh, yes, it can actually be done because they are made from a single viewpoint. So basically, you have to convert the photograph, the annotation in the photograph to a polyline, and then just call the the algorithm. So yes, it could be done. Now I feel insecure a little bit. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, let's move on anyway. Um, definitely, people can ask you questions uh, after. Okay. Um, so the next paper is titled um, Robust Shape Collection Matching and Correspondence from Shape Differences. The authors are Aaron Cohen and Mirella Benchen, and the presenter will be Aaron Cohen. So please play the video. Hello and welcome to Robust Shape Collection Matching and Correspondence from Shape Differences. It's a joint work of me, Aaron Cohen, and Mirella Benchen from Technion, Israel Institute of Technology. So, what are shape collections? Shape collections can be composed from sampling a 3D animation or just by deforming a 3D model as animators do often. So, as you can see here, we can take a given model of an apple or an orange or a face and compose from it a whole new collection with different face expressions, as you can see here. Note that in general, shape collections can be composed from the same character but in different poses, like you can see here, but also can be composed from different characters at the same pose. Since we are a little short in time, you can read in the paper how we treat differently the two different cases. Now let's state our algorithm's goal. Given two different shape collections, as you can see here, a collection of cats and a collection of lions, that we assume that can be matched in a semantically coherent way. We first want to find the matching pairs from the two collections. For example, the standing cat to the standing lion, the walking cat to the walking lion, etc. The second goal of the algorithm is to find the point-to-point -point correspondence from any shape in the first collection to any shape in the other collection. Since within the collection the shapes are mostly isometric, as you can see here it's the same character but in different poses, finding the correspondence within the collection is a quite easy problem, and we assume that these correspondences are given to us. But since the shapes from the two different collections are mostly non-isometric, this problem is much more complex. So our algorithm proposes a solution to the problem of finding the correspondence of non-isometric shapes automatically. Automatically means without any additional information such as landmarks or descriptors. So the only semantic cue for algorithm is the variation within the collection. So let's start from some background. The first part of the background is about functional maps. Functional maps describe how functions on shape A are mapped to shape B. So functions can be represented in a multi-scale basis like Laplace Milkrami basis and this allows us to represent a functional map using a compact matrix F. This is an efficient way to capture the correspondence between the shapes. For example, as you can see here, we can represent a functional map 
as a 50 by 50 matrix and this helps us to map the functions from the apple to the orange. The second part of the background is about shape difference operator. This is a very important tool in our work. So this operator D distorts a function G such that the inner product H on shape M with any other function F equals to the inner product of these mapped functions on the shape N. So intuitively, this operator gives us the information about where the shapes differ. As you can see here, this shape M and N are different, mostly in the upper part. So this operator will distort functions mostly at this part of the shape but not on this part of the shape. So the shape difference operator depends only on the inner product that we define on the shapes and the functional map f between them. By using Laplace Beltrami basis for the functional map, we can obtain the shape difference operator depending on the inner product that we define. For the area-based inner product, we get the shape difference operator denoted by v as f transpose f and the conformal shape difference operator denoted by r is this expression where D is a diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues of the Laplace Beltrami operator. Thanks to this operator, we can now distinguish different shapes easily. Let's, for example, take a collection of 64 spheres with pumps, but pumps only in two directions, as you can see here. And let's calculate the shape difference operator of every shape with respect to a single shape that we choose as the base shape here is the ideal sphere. So after computing the 64 shape difference operators, we can imply on them PCA, and we can embed them in a low dimensional space that we name the shape space. In this case, this space is only two dimensional because the bumps are only in two directions. So thanks to these operators, we can represent all these shapes in a low dimensional space. Now let's see the example of the dataset with the different face expressions. Let's calculate the shape difference operator of every shape with respect to the base shape that was chosen as this shape here and apply on them PCA. After visualizing the principal components on the base shape, we can easily see the areas with most of the variations, the mouth area, the cheeks, the eyes, and we can easily see where are located the differences in this collection. Now let's move to the algorithm. Let's go briefly over the algorithm's block diagram. So we have the two collections A and B, and we first want to embed them in a low dimensional space. After embedding them, we actually have two point clouds, P and Q, that we would like to align. After aligning them, we actually obtain the matches, and the next goal is to find the functional intermap of the two collections. After obtaining the functional intermap, we want to extract a point-to-point -point intermap. So let's start now from the shape space embedding. In order to embed the two collections in a low dimensional shape space, we need to first compute the shape differences matrices set and then compute the distance matrix for each collection. So here you can see the distance matrices that we obtained for the collection of cats and the collection of lions. Here the shapes are, co are ordered correspondingly such that we can see that the distance matrices that we obtain are quite similar. Now the question is how we construct the distance matrix. So for the area-based shape differences, we can benefit from the fact that they are actually symmetric positive definite matrices. And for this case, we have a closed form expression for the Riemannian distance on this manifold. But for the conformal shape differences, since they are not symmetric positive definite, we just use the Euclidean distance, which is an approximation, of course. Having all the distances, we can construct the distance matrix, and now the goal is to embed it in a low dimensional space that we named the shape space. For that goal, we use MDS, and this way we can preserve at least 95% percent of the energy in spaces with dimension of typically 3 to 8. Note that if we use the Euclidean distance, using MDS is equivalent to using PCA. The next step is to align the two shape spaces. 
Now we wish to align the two point clouds P and Q, and we need to find the rotation matrix R and the permutation matrix X in order to minimize the distance between them. After formulating this problem mathematically, we actually obtain the procastis matching problem that already has an efficient solution that we leverage in our algorithm. After aligning the two point clouds, we actually obtain the matches, as you can see here. For the first part of the algorithm, we chose the base shapes randomly, but now we can use the closest pair as the new base shape pair because it's most likely to represent a corresponding pair of shapes. In the paper, we show that the first part of the algorithm is indeed resilient to the random choice of base shapes, but the second part, find, finding the intermap, is not a res a resilient. This is why we do it. The following part is to compute the functional intermap. In order to compute the functional intermap denoted by C, we need to construct an optimization problem with two different terms. The first term is the shape analogies term. The idea behind it is the corresponding shape difference operators in the two collections are similar. So it doesn't matter if we first apply the shape difference operator and then the functional map C, or first apply the functional map C and then the corresponding dif shape difference operator in the other collection. Same for the conformal shape differences. The second term is the regularization term. It's very important in order to obtain stable solutions, and the idea behind it is that we force the functional map to commute with the Laplaceville Crummy operator. As accepted for the solution of this optimization problem, we apply ICP refinement in order to obtain the optimal functional intermap. In this example, you can see the obtained functional map for the data set of the apples and the oranges. So it can be easily seen that we obtain very good results on the face area where all the variations are located, but a little worse results on the side well, you can see that there are no variations, so the shape difference operators don't hold any information about this area. But in the next part, when we extract the point-to-point -point map, we can handle this problem. The last block is extracting the point-to-point -point intermap from the functional intermap. We use existing method in order to do so, but know that we must obtain high quality functional maps in order to allow this process of extracting the point to point map. So, after extracting the point to point intermap from the functional intermap, it's possible to refine the solution with reversible harmonic maps of RHA. It sometimes yields better results. So, we compared our results with other automatic methods for correspondence, such as BIM and PCICP. We also showed the results without post-processing with RHN and with post-processing with RHN. We can see that for this data set, we obtain better results in any case of with and without using RHN. And we can also see quantitatively that we reach better results in terms of conformal distortion, area distortion, and geodesic error. Now we'll see some more results. First, we would like to compare the matching corresponding shapes part of the algorithm. We compare it to the only algorithm known to us achieving this goal, and this SBC14. So in the table, we can indeed see that we obtain better results independent of the collection size, while SBC is dependent on the collection size. The reason is that SBC14 uses non-linear method for dimensionality reduction, while we use linear method. Therefore, we are not dependent on the collection size to obtain good results. Here we compare the functional intermap computed using our method and that of SBC14. We can see that our functional map transfers function in a less distorted way than SBC14. We can also see that our functional map matrix is more similar to the ground truth than SBC14. Now we compare the pointwise intermap obtained for the Faust dataset. So you can see that without post-processing with RHM, 
we obtain a little worse results than BIM. But after post-processing with RHM, we actually get even better results. Not only for this case, but also for this case. Even though you can see some distortions in the hand area and ankle area, our result reaches lower geodesic error than beams because the line in the ankle should actually be higher than what beam produces. Analyzing more quantitatively, we can see that indeed using our method with post-processing by RHM, we obtain the best results in terms of geodesic error and we reach beam in terms of area distortion and conformal distortion. For the summary dataset, we don't have the ground truth, therefore we show only the conformal distortion and the area distortion. And we can see that we reach very high quality results, especially after post-processing by RHM, and the results are comparable to BIM. Now we'd like to show that we can compute the map for any shape in the first collection to any shape in the other. For that goal, we use the computed map for the base shapes and use the given maps for within the collection. The direct map case shows what happens if we use these two shapes as base shapes. We see some distortions in the area where they differ. But our algorithm mostly yields base shapes that are corresponding. So we can see that we can obtain high quality results even for the areas where they differ. Raises the question what happens if the matching part was less than perfect. So for this goal, we set the matching accuracy manually for 60, 70, 80 and 100 percent and see what point-to-point -point map we get for every case. So we can see that even for 80 percent accuracy, we can get high quality maps for the dataset of files. Now we'd like to test the Ryan collection size and see how it affects the intermaps. So we use different collection size, as you can see, two shapes in a collection, 3, 5, 10, and 40. In this case, for the plane shapes, the face expression datasets. And we see that we get the same high quality result for all the collection size that we tested. Also for the summary dataset. In order to explain this result, we must understand the regularization effect, or how the regularization term affects the solution of the optimization problem. So, in order to do so, we tested the functional map error for different collection sizes and for the running alpha. We can easily see that when using no regularization, i.e. alpha equals zero, when we increased the collection size, the functional map error decreased. It makes sense because when increasing the collection size, we have more analogies in the analogies term, therefore more information. But when setting alpha to a good range in this area, we get the same functional map error for all collection sizes. So we are not dependent on the collection size anymore. We can also note that when increasing alpha, we reach the result of no analogies at all. So to conclude, we presented an easy to implement algorithm, which his main contributions are matching the corresponding pairs from the two shape collections with a high rate of accuracy and automatically obtain a high quality non isometric correspondence between any shape in one collection to any shape in the other. To summarize, our method handles collections of different size. You can also see in the paper that it handles excess shapes that do not need to be matched. It obtains high quality intermaps using only the analogies, serving as a fully automatic method. In other words, we don't need any additional information such as landmarks or descriptors. It yields good correspondences even if matching was less than perfect. And we can handle large variations within the collection and of different types. For future work, we would suggest testing other inner product metrics for the shape difference operators, using other regularization constraints for the optimization problem that we formulated. It's also possible to see how multiple base shapes helps. 
and maybe it's possible to learn the shape difference operators from data. Thank you so much for listening and feel free to ask me any question that you'd like. All right, uh, thank you for this great walk. Um, let's see if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, not yet, okay, so let me start with one. Um, so you show great improvement over SBC 14, um, but if, if I remember correctly, uh, the paper is the concepts are very similar. So you also have the shape difference operator there and uh, you use MDS and ICP to, to match the two, <clears throat> the two sets. Can you um, maybe highlight the differences between the two papers? Uh, well, the algorithm is quite similar in general, but every block has now a different way to implement it. So we improved every block of the algorithm and in this way, we can have an algorithm that can produce good results with comparable inter functional intermap, both functional and both point to point. So this, the main differences you can, there are very, there are very different uh, differences, but in every block, you can see them uh, in more details in the paper. Okay, but, but uh, the shape difference uh, and the ICP are the same and it's more about the, the second part of the paper, maybe when you have the uh, new regularization term uh, and the reversible harmonic maps. Is that, is that correct or? Um, for the second part, yes, this is, these are the main differences, but previously the point-to-point -point maps that were obtained, that it was of low quality, that is, it wasn't comparable at all to any other method. Okay. Um, I don't see any other question. Let me double check. Um, okay. Um, in that case, uh, thank you again. You're welcome, thank you. And we'll move on to the next presentation. Okay, so the next talk uh, is titled Farm Functional Automatic Registration Method for 3D Human Bodies. Um, the authors are Ricardo Marin, Simone Mezzi, Emanuele Rodola, uh, and Umberto Castelli. Umberto Castellani, uh, and the speaker will be Ric uh, Ricardo Marin. Uh, please play the video. Hello everyone, I am Ricardo Marin, a PhD student from the University of Verona, and today I'm going to present FARM, Functional Automatic Registration Method for 3D Human Bodies. This work is a joint project between the University of Verona and Sapienza University of Rome. 3D human bodies is a class of model that received a lot of attention since the early stages of computer graphics. Already 30 years ago, the researchers were working on techniques to acquire and modeling humans. In the animation called Rendezvous in Montreal, the sculptures of Marilyn Monroe and Dupri Bogart were acquired by Talman's poses with photogrammetry. In the subsequent year, the advancements in computer vision have changed the rule of the game. Today, acquiring human bodies is so common that the 3D selfie concept has its own page on Wikipedia. Retrieve real human data has never been so easy. We can acquire them with single or multiple cameras, depth sensor, laser scan, and so on. However, all these data sources produce models with a huge variety of different characteristics. They can have different scales, poses, identities, and also artifacts related to noise, self-contact, and holes. Finally, each shape has its own discretization with different patterns and qualities. To benefit from all this data and to study their geometrical properties, we need to align them in a common space. We want to solve this problem and do it in an unsupervised setup. Our method, FARM, is composed as follows. Given a target 3D human body model, we want to register a deformable template to it. 
To do so, we compute a correspondence between the template and the target, and we use this information to guide the optimization of the template parameters. Also, in the end of this optimization, we want to refine locally the template surface to catch all the details outside its generative space. So we rely on a combination of two plus one ingredients. The first is a template that we want to register to the target human shape. The second is a correspondence method to lead our optimization to the correct solution. Finally, the plus one is some good automatic hints to initialize the correspondence method. As template, we use the well-known SIMPLE model. SIMPLE is a generative model learned over a large dataset of real scans. It can modify its identity and pose acting on two sets of parameters. SIMPLE is equipped with rigging properties like skinning weights and skeleton hierarchy. It has also a joint regressor to retrieve the joint's coordinate for different identities. Finally, it has a set of deformation bases to modify body characteristics. In this example, I have animated simple by changing its identity during its movements. On the top left, you can see the identity modified in T-Pose. On the right, there is the final result obtained by manipulating the two sets of parameters. Simple has also some linear bases linked to the pose parameters to correct linear blend skinning artifacts, and you can see this correction on the bottom left. The most important characteristic of SIMPLE is that it is differentiable, and this makes it useful to solve optimization problems. So, we have our first ingredient, the template. Now we need the correspondence between our template and the target model to lead our optimization. To do so, we choose Functional Map. Functional Map framework relies upon the idea to solve the correspondence by computing a map to transfer functions between the two shapes. If we can transfer function, we can transfer indicator functions as well, and this solves the point-to-point -point correspondence. I will provide a quick overview of this framework. Let's say that we have a function over one shape. This function can be seen as a vector that associates a scalar value to each vertex. Since it is a vector, we can decompose it for a proper basis set. A common choose is the Laplace Beltrami operator eigenvectors. These bases are analogous with the Fourier bases in one dimensional case, and they can be ordered from lowest to highest frequencies. They encode the global geometrical property of the shape, and they are optimal to represent smooth functions. Different models have also different LBO eigenvectors. For example, some signs can be inverted, as you can see here. The same function defined over two different meshes can have completely different coefficients in its basis decomposition. The goal of the functional map is to find the change-based matrix that align these coefficients. To do so, we need some probe function to set up a linear system to solve. For example, landmark can be seen as a function that provides good local information. When we have enough descriptor, we state our problem in this way. We want to find the matrix C that can transform the coefficient of one shape to the coefficient of the other. This could be solved in a closed form. However, sometimes we do not have enough functions to have a determinate system. This leads to an optimization problem that can involve several regularizations. For example, we can ask the map to commute with some operators or encourage properties like biactivity. Solving this optimization, we obtain our functional map C. In this case, it is 60 times 60. From that, we can obtain our correspondence. Usually, the correspondence is visualized in this way, so if it is a good point-to-point -point matching, the two shapes are colored coherently. As you can see here, functional maps suffer from non-isometric deformation, like in this case over the right leg and the stomach. Now we have a template and a correspondence method. What is missing is the plus one. We need some good prop functions to compute functional maps. As we saw, landmarks are valid function, and our goal now is find landmarks in an automatic way. It is well known that the first eigenfunctions of the Laplace Beltrami operator are located over the protrusions. Then a first idea could be to choose the extremal point of these regions to have five landmarks, over the head, on the hands, and on the feet. However, they have two major problems. The first is that, as we saw before, they can be sign flipped. The second is that these bases are really sensitive to topological noise. In this case, a simple self-touching between the hands dramatically changed the basis behavior. 
For this reason, we decided to use a different strategy. To obtain landmarks location over the protrusion, we use discrete time evolution process descriptor. As its name, the descriptor simulates a discrete time process over the surface. It is composed as follow. First, we need to compute the metrics of normalized geodesic distances. Then, we define our relation matrix by inverting these distances. In this way, the neighborhood is more relevant and the further point are less. Then we compute the area berry cell for each vertex. And we compose our process operator by multiplying the relation operator with the area matrix. Matrix A represents a single step of our evolution process. The descriptor is obtained by considering the limit of this process. This requires to solve an infinite series. In the paper of DAP is shown that setting a proper regularization factor R, this series converge and can be solved by inverting a matrix. Finally, the descriptor is obtained by multiplying it by a vector that represents the state zero function. In general, it is the constant vector. Also, DAP permits to have a multi-scale setup by thresholding the distance matrix. In this way, we consider only localized geodesic poles for the vertices, capturing more local information. Now, the main reason that leads us to this descriptor is that it encodes a global relation over the surface. It acts like a diffusion, without requiring to use spectral properties of the model. This makes it more robust to the topological noise. We also see empirically that it has a real stable behavior over human bodies. In the initial scales, it is strongly localized over the head, while for higher scale, it diffuses over the body, clustering the protrusions. Here, it is easy to recognize the extremal point of the head, and then the landmarks can be obtained for each cluster as the furthest point from the head. However, while we can distinguish between feet and hands, all this process is intrinsic and we cannot directly label left and right. To solve this problem, we will use the fit information as the front of the shape. With this information, we can build a coherent reference frame between the two models. But humans are articulated, and several poses, like this, can provide ambiguous information. We desire to have the front side information at the center of the body, where there is no room for ambiguities. Our idea is to propagate the fit orientation to the center of the body. Propagate this information over the surface is not so straightforward, and it's easier to work with a skeletonized structure. So, here is our strategy. As shown before, simple template is equipped with a join regressor. The join regressor is a function, and since we have a functional map, we will transfer this function to the target shape to retrieve the skeleton. However, Joint regressor is a sparse matrix, and it can be seen as a high-frequency function that is not good transferred by our low-frequency map. Instead of directly transferring the regressor, we consider the coordinate of the target as functions, and we compute their low-pass representation. Coordinates are more smooth than the regressor, and we can transfer them using the functional map. Now, this transferred representation is in the same space of simple model, and we can directly apply the regressor to it. While it is not perfect, the pose is overall recovered. In this way, we obtain a skeleton over the target model. Now, to solve the symmetry, we can compute a system of planes over the bones to transfer the vector to the middle of the body. In this way, we obtain a clear front direction that permits to disambiguate left and right and then order the landmarks coherently between the two shapes. Ok, now we have all our ingredients and we can see how farm works. So, we have our template on the right and the target mesh on the left. We preprocess the target by scaling, fixing non-manifold artifacts and also by remeshing it to the resolution of our template. Then, we compute the landmarks and we order them using our symmetry break technique. With this information, we initialize our functional map. Here, the correspondence can have some artifacts due to non isometric deformations, but it's overall a good starting point for our optimization problem. We start to optimize our template parameters using energy that takes into account all the information that we collect so far. We properly weight the energy to the skeleton fitting, that is a good hint about the pose, the energy for the landmarks, and the energy for the correspondence. Also, we have two regularization terms to avoid that the parameters fall in some local minima too fast. These regularization terms are progressively relaxed during the optimization. 
After some iterations, we notice that our models start to be more isometric with the target. For this reason, now we compute our correspondence, obtaining a more reliable point-to-point -point matching. At this point, we also add some local correspondence over the hands and head, by registering the local patches using current point drift. These regions require more precision to obtain a good result. Also, the standard simple model does not have hands animation, and this area is prone to errors. At the end of the optimization, we obtain something like this. The template is close to the target, the pose is overall recovered, but since we only optimize its parameter, we do not catch all the details that are outside of the template generative space. To refine the registration, we optimize the vertices of the template to fit the target surface using an as rigid as possible regularization. And this is our result. To give you a better insight about this optimization process, I would like to show you an example. Here we have our template on the left and the target model on the right. The target is colored with point of surface error, where white is zero error and black is one centimeter or more. This video is not in real time. Usually a registration takes between 20 to 40 minutes. However, if you need to register several shapes, you can parallelize the steps, obtaining an average time of 5 minutes. Now I'm going to show you some interesting results obtained with our method. Form is resilient to several challenging cases. For example, topological noise due to self-touching or dressed humans. Also, functional maps provide support for different representations, so our pipeline can be modified to work with point clouds using some Laplacian estimation or with range scans using deep functional maps. Functional maps is also defined to work with partiality, and so we can register the visible part and complete the absent one in a current way. We tested our method on some extreme shapes, like gorilla and kids. While their proportions are far from the one of simple model, we see that the method does not break up and the overall structure is respected. We also show a texture on our results to highlight that while there are several artifacts, the registration of the template provides smooth and continuous matching that respect the semanticity of the shapes. One of the major advantages to have registered the template to a target model is that we are also able to transfer all the properties of the template to the target. This is particularly relevant for animation, and we can automatically rig in arbitrary shape. The registration provides also the pose parameters, making pose transfer particularly simple. In fact, we can invert the pose, bringing the shape in T pose, and then switching it to the one we desire. One of the main limitations of the original farm pipeline is the resolution of the template. Simple model has less than 7000 vertices, and many soft tissue and local behaviors cannot be fully recovered. For this reason, in a follow-up work, we extend the pipeline by adding subdivision surfaces during the final as rigid as possible optimization. We also set up a strategy based on mean curvature to densify the template only on the required regions. This step can be used in the final optimization without impact the performances of the overall pipeline. This is an example with also several synthetic and artist craft details. Concluding, the benefits of our pipeline are many, and it helps to study several geometrical properties. For example, since we are able to provide a good correspondence between all these models, last year we proposed a Shrek benchmark to study the behavior of axiomatic matching methods over shapes with different triangulations. This sheds new light on the correlation between triangulation and geometry in the task of recovering correspondence between 3D surfaces. As future work and limitation, we only study the pipeline behavior using simple or the escape models. They are powerful and data-driven templates, learned over thousands of examples, and not all domains have these nice tools. I would like to share with you a preliminary experiment. We applied our pipeline substituting simple with a novelly smoothed version of it. In a friendly way, we call this new template Homunculus. Homunculus has all the perks of simple, LBS skinning system, joint regressor, and the identity deformation basis. However, it is a less human template and represents a sort of primitive template. The result of our pipeline looks like this. While the dramatic collapsed part still not inflated, the overall pose and several identities feature are correctly recovered. 
This motivates us to explore in future some pure axiomatic and geometrical templates, enlarging the span of possible domain and applications. By concluding this talk, I would like to highlight that all the code of this work and this extension can be found on my GitHub repository. I would like to thank my co-authors and you all for your attention. Okay, Ricardo, thank you for this talk. Uh, it looks amazing. Let's see if there are questions. Um, I'll start with one. Um, so I think one of the trickiest things about this is to indeed avoid local minimas. You mentioned it in the in the talk. Um, so the template optimization, right? You need to add a couple. Of, you mentioned a few uh, regularization terms. I think two. Can you? Can you maybe elaborate on what they are exactly? Sure. Um, basically, there are two uh, regularization terms. There is one for uh, identity. That basically it's just um, a constraint over the magnitude of uh, shape parameters of simple. So you are in, in the start of the process, you're not allowed to start with some unreasonable and two extreme uh, identities. And the other one, the regularization term for the pose, basically has some constraint over the magnitude of uh, the rotation for the linear blend skinning. So okay. we start assuming that just uh, you can just move uh, the articulation a really little and we relax this when we arrive uh, really close to the surface. And uh, I also say that you, you reduce the weights of the regularization in order to get a better fit uh, at the end, right? Yeah. Um, what's, what's your strategy of doing that? Um, there, is a, there isn't any particular strategy. Uh, it's uh, just um, that after um, some empirical number of iteration, we just uh, drop uh, the weights uh, in a really, really little term. Okay, but this is a strategy. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Maybe another question I, I have. Um, the optimization itself, it takes uh, how long? You said uh, a few minutes? Uh, it takes around uh, 40 minutes for one square 40 shape. Minutes. But we can parallelize it. If you have many shapes, you can parallelize the different steps. Okay. Uh, what's the the main bottleneck there? Oh, that's a very good question. I think that the main uh, bottleneck is the optimization of the model. Um, we don't uh, take uh, into account uh, any particular strategy. Also, we don't use some uh, some particularly new. A dif auto automatic differentiable library. We use the native one of uh, Simple, and uh, uh, I think that also another bottleneck is uh, the resolution of uh, the target mesh in the initial uh, pro processing. Okay, and this is around. Oh, um, if, we, if if you have to check them. Uh... Okay. Uh, yeah, it's uh, I don't uh, I, I don't have it at the time actually, but um, I think that. Uh, this really depends by the resolution of the mesh. Okay. Okay, well, anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. And um, right, so this concludes the session. Right, so I would like to thank all the speakers again. Uh, yeah, so let's all give them a uh, round of virtual applause on the YouTube channel. Um, so I wish you all a nice day and have a great weekend.